show. Who that is coming off a loop? So you're saying that that <coughs> there everything could be true, right? Is that what you were saying? Not everything. I'm saying if we're talking about something um, and we're having a debate about something, a lot of times both things can be true. Because of perception. We're just, yeah, we're just trying to argue about who's right instead of thinking about, well, maybe there's a percentage or a level of truth to both our points. And I was saying that being a merciless killer, mafia Don, runner of Tampa, Florida, is also makes him a good person. I don't know who he is, but you said merciless. So how does that make you a good person? Because you have to be, if you're going to control without like a mercy. whole, yeah, you have, if you're going to control the underworld, right? If you're going to be the boss of bosses, we're talking about Santo Traficante. Traficante is just his last name for real? Traficantes. Traficantes. That was like his for real last name? Yeah. Santos Traficante. Traficante. This is, uh, Tampa's well this is his son now senior born in Tampa in 1914 wow and his father I guess there's no picture of his father on Wikipedia but these his guys dad was born 1886 in Sicia, Siciana Sicily Italy where the mob was created Sicily so South Italy so when people were migrating at the time to Florida this guy came down here um to tampa his, his ju- senior the father right because Santino. there was a lot of bootlegging going Trafacante. on the alcohol would come in from the caribbean from cuba right mm-hmm. and it would land this in tampa the, was prohibition happening right okay he got there in like uh early late 1920s early 1930s senior did and he was involved heavily in bootlegging and bringing in uh exotic alcohol from south america and he was of course associated with la costa nostra costa nostra and uh he ruled tampa i mean this was a guy that you know everybody knows about ybor city now it's a party capital back then it was a party capital also i was gonna say not so much now a party capital well florida people go there to party that's one of the ybor city yeah what about the nah dog miles venus strip club miles venus is is there in tampa but i would say a few hundred thousand people go to that pirates festival every year yes gasparilla for sure for sure for sure but not necessarily a capital ebor city well, wasn't specifically that where, that's 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 the hub of all the clubs and stuff yeah that's where the just you know it's it's not like to me right because you're a party champion you're a party <laughs> captain you've been you've been not you've even been that. To the i'm not, I'm not trying been to, to the pinnacle no, i'm not even trying to like flex or anything i'm just saying like a professional I've, I've, I've been around places and had fun in places and there i haven't had as much fun as i've had in other places that's all i'm saying well we used to get on a party bus and drive down to tampa and we would turn that into a magic school bus full of mushrooms yeah, yeah. and alcohol. Oh. oh, it was good times. And the things that happened in Tampa, even at a moderate level that we experience, mm-hmm. that place has been doing that for a long time. Like I, I produces, don't deny that as well. It produces these people. Not trying to hate. And Santos was a guy that really took advantage. Not only did he do alcohol, he was involved in Bolita. What's Bolita? Bolita is a Cuban lottery. Before the lottery okay. was big, you know, running the numbers, running the numbers. So no. he had a huge racket. Play two one seven straight. Sorry, <laughs> and he was Italian, and the Italians, um, especially him, he knew Spanish. He was better able to deal with a lot of the Hispanic immigrants that were coming in from South America and the Caribbean, okay. because there were other gangsters in Tampa. Right. Like Charlie Wall. We're going to talk about him in another episode. Charlie Wall. But he was called like the Redneck Mafia. He okay. controlled the Redneck Mafia because there was these people. There was other people also. So cast said char- like, underworld that, characters. Is that like the white people? Yeah. Like is that all the white people? Or were these, there other type of. The ones that controlled. Gangster. Shit in Tampa. Yeah. I guess some people would consider Italians white, right? Some, but they have like a Latin. I wonder if origin. the redneck folk, the redneck gangsters, would 
call them white or no? They call them WAPs or Dagos. Oh, that's what that is. Right, 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 right. Before, or well, not before, but at the same time, the blacks were going through their yeah. struggle and oppression because of the white man. And Continuous. Native Americans were going through the same thing. Continuous. Hispanic Americans. I think also Continuous. Italian Americans had a lot to Everybody. deal with. <clears throat> the crazy thing is that. Yo, where can you be from? To where you're not offensive to a racist anywhere outside of america what do you mean there doesn't seem to be no uh, no where where can you be from like where you have oh, to like okay. yeah i would still say outside of america like, so german like a german white I, german person would I, probably be accepted right as far as a racist person in america i think so I'm just confused about like I'm confused where about that you. where that level like where does the the gradient of color? Well, why don't why bam. don't I've heard white supremacists don't like Jewish people and like most Jewish people to me look white, right? So it's not how they look, right? It's it's what it's their ideal. I think you have to be as close at to the Caucasian race. What's that though? <laughs> the they, I guess they come from the Caucasian mountains. Where's that? Uh, northern europe northern europe so like norwegian area like netherlands okay stuff like that sweden okay they're like the original white man the viking the viking so as close to a viking as possible and if you're not then you're just not as good as them and they they're don't they really you. they're i think they're about separating themselves because they feel like their race is being diluted with other races okay. You all know right. what I mean? I don't know. It, 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 I'm assuming all this stuff from movies that I've watched. <laughs> no, I just like I like I like hearing it every once in a while just to hear how fucking movies. stupid it sounds. For right. real. Well, do you think being a mafia in the mafia, considering you know we talk about the in the gang episodes like Zo Pound, mm -hmm. how immigrants get together based on the fact that they're maybe being oppressed by the people that are yeah, already there's here. There's that part, right? And they get together and form a back gang. then anyway. Back then, anyway. The and Italians, even now, right? Well, so yeah, like but shit. there's something about the way the Italians did it. They're, they're the reason why they call the whole organized crime thing. The Italians really came up with that idea about being organized. Really? Cause you, you, I think so, because like when we talk about gangs in New York, right? You had like Irish gangs that were together because of immigrant status and being in a new country and stuff but they were still kind of they had some structure but it wasn't as organized as the italians that came a little bit later because of the way that maybe their hierarchy mm -hmm. is you know from Set like up. godfather to bosses to capos mm -hmm. it's very similar to military mm -hmm. structures and they brought they brought they brought such an organized form to the crime element in the united states that the social criminal justice you know reformers they, yeah, they would yeah. have to come up with new laws like the rico yeah. where basically conspiracy right. was brought into legal matters and what that what, means is they, they that the, if the government can come up with a plausible story that you can believe with beyond a reasonable doubt then we can try these people. We don't mm -hmm. even have to have our hard evidence. Like, if I'm the mob boss, right, mm -hmm. and I I don't kill nobody, I don't touch none of the drugs right, right. or anything. How can you impl implicate Im me? Implicate, yeah. Because you've been arresting all these lower soldiers. So when they invented these RICO laws and these conspiracy laws, they were allowed to basically turn the soldiers into six nines. <laughs> this is the first level of six nines. It's Takashi. They were Takashi like eighteen eighty six. Exactly. We can, we're going to give you. Uh, well, it didn't really come to the fifties. I think oh, nineteen fifty. And it was because of, and we'll find out the link of this, right? It was because of Robert Kennedy, right? Uh, JFK's brother yeah. was coming hard down on the mafia because before then you had Edgar Hoover, right? Mm -hmm. He was the, the the FBI chief, but. According to certain interviews and movies that I've seen, I guess Edgar Hoover was an in-the-closet gay person, and okay. he was in love with his assistant because he didn't have a wife or anything. And th they said that the mafia actually had video of J. Edgar Hoover in women's clothes mm -hmm. and doing gay stuff. And at the time, <laughs> that was very controversial. You weren't allowed to be the FBI agent and be 
homosexual. It just right. sucked. It was the time. Yeah. So when they asked J. Edgar Hoover, what do you think about the mafia? He said, I don't think the mafia exists. And right. We seem, people seem to think I, you know, being like a, a mafia kind of like fan or whatever mm -hmm. of like learning the stories that he didn't go after the mafia because they had some shit. So right. when he retired and Robert F. Kennedy came in with the new FBI chief, he was like, I want to go after the mafia. We're going to go hard after the mafia, which is a little bit hypocritical because his father, right, Joe Kennedy, was a bootlegger that did business with Santo Traficante and all wow. these people. So you're going to see how Santos was maybe involved in the JFK well, it wouldn't, assassination. It wouldn't, it wouldn't make him hypocritical necessarily. Why? Because he's not his father. So, But th that his, father's his father's money and influence got him into power. Well, Arguably good. the mafia. Well, good. So now he can do something right with it. It's awesome. If he thinks he'd be like, sweet, I'll sleep on him. He put me where I need to be, and then I can try to like stop all this bullshit. So I respect that. He's kind of like a six nine. Nah, 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 nah. How he, is he a six nine? How is Robert Kennedy like a six nine? He benefited from a criminal syndicate that was supporting him and getting him into power. Six nine was doing the same thing. He wasn't the child of like the Trey Nines, but he was a kid. But. Six nine did crimes. Robert Kennedy did not. That we know of. Yes, I don't think the apple falls far from the tree. I think it does when one apple tries to prosecute crimes that the other apple did perpetrated. You know, or the other, the tree perpetrated. Yeah, I, I guess I struggle with that because it is your father, and like, but if he's if he's like coming down on people for the same shit, then obviously he thinks something's. Or he's trying to be elected. Well, here's the flip of the coin. It's I guess it's all about your personality and perception. Like we started the podcast, right? Because mm -hmm. we're going to see that Senior gave Who? the power to Junior. Kennedy? No, Santos Traficante. Yeah, yeah. He ruled from 1889, uh, whatever. Oh, he was around from 1889 to 1950. He died mm -hmm. of stomach cancer. And then he gave the power to his son, Santo Traficante Jr. It's kind of like o young ODB. How is it like? Because you're taking your father's legacy and you're going hard. So, oh, young ODB is going hard. Yeah. Okay. He's doing the same thing his father did. I haven't seen it. Have you? He I looks just like you. Haven't seen young ODB. I've seen him. He looks just like his dad. That's how he's how he's how he's going hard by looking yeah. like him. I mean, he's following the legacy. He perform every I mean, time. Kids kind of just look Wu like Tang their got, parents gets together. He performs his dad's song. As I ODB. I've seen that. Yeah, it's dope. He it's drops songs. Dope. I mean, all right, all right, yeah, cool, cool they, for a gold DB. So Central Traffic, I think. Have you Junior seen the Wu Tang the thing on Hulu? It's amazing. It's amazing because it's, it's not amazing. even like a movie. It's not even like a. It's not even like a a Wu Tang Clan show. It's a show about them. It's a show about Bobby and fucking his brothers, uh, his brothers, and the guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. You don't even think Ghostface or whoever. You don't think these people. You think of these characters, and it's good. Yeah. Sorry. Side note. Go nah, ahead. it's good stuff. Watch it on Hulu, yeah, man. I enjoyed it. Oh, wait a minute. I think Kimberly wants to give us the facts. Okay, boys, this might come off like I'm 6'9 snitching. <laughs> but most of the world already knows all the facts I'm about to give your ears. This episode is about the Tampa mob and powerful sperm. The father and son dons. The made men of Tampa and a powerful mafia dick. Santo Traffic Anti Senior. May 28, 1886, August 11, 1954, was a Sicilian-born mobster and father of the powerful mobster Santo Traffic Anti Jr. Santo Traffic Anti Sr. gained power as a mobster in Tampa, Florida, and ruled the mafia in Tampa from the 1930s until his death in 1954. Traffic Anti was heavily involved in the operation of illegal Bolita lotteries. During his reign, Traffic Anti was a well-respected boss with ties to Charles Lucky Luciano and Thomas Lucchese. He sent his son Santo Traffic Anti Jr. to New York City to learn from other mobsters. Upon his death, Santo Traffic Anti Sr. gave the power to his son, Santo Traffic Anti Jr. This was a respected decision since the New York bosses and Tampa mobsters liked Santo Jr. Traffic Anti died of stomach cancer on August 11, 1954. He was a member of El Union Italiana, and he was buried in El Union Italiana Cemetery in Eber City. Santo Traffic Anti Jr., November 15, 1914 March 17, 1987, was among the most powerful mafia bosses in the United States. 
He headed the traffic anti-crime family and controlled organized criminal operations in Florida and Cuba, which had previously been consolidated from several rival gangs by his father, Santo Traffic Anti Sr. reputedly the most powerful crime boss in Batista era Cuba, he never served a prison sentence in the U.S. Traffic Anti turned his father's criminal organization into a multi-billion dollar international organized crime empire. Multi-billion Traffic dollar. Anti was reportedly a multi-billionaire, and wielded enormous power and influence all over the United States and Cuba by paying off police, judges, federal prosecutors, city officials, Around government officials, States. local and- He was a billionaire. Hmm. <clears throat> He's a multi-billionaire. Yeah, multi. An internet. That's that special room when you come into the bay. National politicians, mayors, governors, senators, congressmen, CIA agents, and FBI agents. Traffic and he maintained links to the banana. That's everybody. Yeah. This this this. Did guy. you say senators? Yeah. This, this is everybody. Straight from Tampa. From Tampa. Prime family. Once again, in New Florida. York City, God but damn. was more closely allied with Sam Giancana in Chicago. Consequently, not to mention he was a billionaire back then. Right. In the sorry, right in the um, thirties, twenties. No, thirties or forties. Yeah, thirties and forties. He's a billionaire in the thirties. Billionaire, multi-billionaire. That and that in the thirties. That white lightning was that cocaine before cocaine was Ooh. cocaine. Whew. So where uh Traficante from Tampa though, but what's before that was Sicily. Sicily. Wow, dog. South Italy. It's amazing because I met this amazing individual named Ginger Versace from Southern <laughs> Italy a few days ago. It's Shout out to Ginger Versace. Kismet. Kismet. So we're learning about his like OG crime syndicate. I don't know where he was from exactly. I know he's from South Italy, so I'm not trying to get very specific. But anyway, was he a traficante? Was he? No, he wasn't. Ah, fuck him then. While generally recognized as the most powerful organized crime figure in Florida throughout much of the 20th century, Traffic Anti was not believed to have total control over Miami, Miami Beach, F.T. Lauderdale, or Palm Beach. F.T. Lauderdale. The East Coast of Florida was a loosely knit conglomerate of New York family interests with links to Meyer Lansky, Bugsy Siegel, Angelo Bruno, Carlos Marcello, and Frank Ragano. Traffic Anti admitted his anti-Castro activities to the United States House Select Committee on Assassinations in 1978. Though he vehemently denied any association with a conspiracy against President John F. Kennedy, at least one witness before federal investigators testified that Traffic Anti predicted the assassination in spring of 1963. Federal investigators brought racketeering and conspiracy charges against him in summer of 1986. Traffic Anti was summoned to court in 1986 and questioned about his involvement with the King's Court Bottle Club operated by members of the Bonanno crime family, including undercover FBI agent Joseph D. Joe Pistone, a.k.a. Donnie Brasco. Donnie Brasco! Traffic Anti Great again movie. escaped conviction. He died on March 17, 1987 at the age of 72. His wife, Josephine, died in 2015 at the age of 95. He is survived Hi. by two of his daughters. After the death of his wife, the Traffic Anti family sold their Tampa 1970 built home for $950,000. That's it? In February 2016, well, 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 many of Traffic Ante's personal that. belongings were sold at an auction in St. Petersburg, Florida. It's fucking Treyway bitches. We don't bend or fold. Free the real. <laughs> Kimberly, come Shout on. Shout out to Shoddy. Free Shoddy. Wow. Don't, no. Why would we free Shoddy? When are you doing the I leadership? I feel bad. Yeah, but I feel bad. Feel bad what? It's a grown he was, man. He was a good guy. Trying to take advantage of a situation. He could have been a Traficante one day. They also got to start from somewhere. Yeah, well, if you're smart enough in that situation, you could do maybe some crazy shit and then just stop. You don't think it's a little because they're unorganized black gang? What? I think that these Italians got a lot farther with their criminal operation because they were white and well organized. People like the Nine Trey Gangsters blood set that started in jail weren't as organized, sophisticated. You know, we talk about this all the time <clears throat> in the barrier of color in America, this racism that constantly gets brought up in banking, real estate, it even fraud. It even manifests itself in gang culture. Crime. Yeah, like 
it seems like the yeah. black gangs are less sophisticated than the white gangs because they don't have the access that the white gangs have. Look at the way this guy was connected with politicians and all types of people. I mean, at this point, I think all races are nah. having access to nah. multi-level. At I this think point. it's too late with the crime thing at this because point. technology is caught up. That's a huge variable in this shit. That's, That's what I'm saying. So everybody has access to technology. But if, every if the race, world every, wasn't as racist, maybe we would have seen some black mafia dons back in the day. Um, that was back in the day when they were still using fucking celluloid to take pictures of people or whatever. And they're still going to dark rooms now. That that has no bearing, you know. What I'm saying is that that yet another area of the world, and it, or not the world, but the United States and history, where because of the color of your skin, you're yeah, less back likely then. to be successful. Back then, for sure. I don't Today know sucks because there's too much technology. You don't have the opportunity to be a successful gangster. Yeah, you do if you're if you know what you're doing in technology. Maybe, you can be, maybe that's why we don't know about it yet. No, we do know about it. They they just sometimes they get caught, sometimes they don't. The woman who scammed Citibank? No, uh, I don't know what it was, but she had a bunch. She just knew what she was doing. Yeah, in the but matrix they didn't have of the an world. Organized criminal syndicate like the mob. Yo, what's more mafia. organized than fucking code? And you got math. caught. You weren't able to make that billions of dollars. That person wasn't. But every day, there's somebody taking point zero zero one percent of somebody. Are they bank black account. though? Maybe. Yes, absolutely. That's what I'm saying. At this point, they're any color, they're any race. They're it's it's the net, it's the internet, it's the fucking it's code, it's ones and zeros, bro. It's the it's that little bald dude sitting at the table saying ignorance is bliss, eating that piece of steak, thinking about how he can just see the code, and people can do that across all races and whatever. At this point, crime is beyond, you know, obviously what we're talking about here. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't know, but this guy was running in the money. Hell yeah. Billions of dollars in the 30s, player. And not to mention his son took over all that Tampa. shit, too. Yo, was man, the hellhole that's of the Gulf Coast. Scary. Like father, Traficante was quintessentially a mafia don, a person like the Godfather. Like son. He had Yo, cold, he doesn't look killer like eyes. Person. And if he looked you straight in the eyes, he could make your heart skip. A few beats. With the feds hunting them. We're only interested in uh, large scale organized crime. There's no limit to what a family will do to protect its own. He was found with his throat cut and he had his head bashed in. You gotta understand that these people don't have a conscience. They're ruthless, they're killers, they're murderers, and they just don't care. All the stuff we were talking about. Mobsters. No blacks allowed. <laughs> right. That was in that um Hulu show. Remember when the guy came in and he played the uh, that like Frank oh, Sinatra man, whatever bro. weird shit. It's like holy crap. It That's was real back then. Super racist. Super racist. April 18th. We're talking about the Wu Tang show. Check it out on Hulu. 1955. Local resident Charlie Wall stumbled through the streets of downtown Tampa, ducking in and out of local bars. This is the other guy that we're going to talk about in another episode. 1995. To look at him, Wall seemed like a typical bum. But the 73-year-old mobster had run a criminal empire in Tampa, controlling the area's illegal gambling rackets and corrupting local politicians. Charlie Wall was one of the first real underworld kingpins in Tampa. In fact, he was called the Dean of the Underworld. But Santo Trapacanti Jr. and his father, Santo Sr., had taken Wall's territory by force. Wall bitterly resented the Trapacantis and wanted them dead. For the rest of the night, he ran his mouth all over town about his hatred for the family. And there were people that said he was simply bad-mouthing Traficante quite frequently. Two days later, Charlie Wall's wife returned home from vacation. 
whatever welcome she expected, a much different one greeted her. Mm. She found her husband in a pool of blood, brutally murdered, wearing only a nightshirt. He was found with his throat cut and he had his head bashed in with a billy club. Damn. Santo Jr. had sent a deadly message. No one crosses the Traficanti family. Bullets and bolita. Sounds like something you get in jail. Years before <laughs> Santo Jr. was even born, Santo Traficanti the first made the long voyage from Italy to the United States in search of the American dream. The 14-year-old and his family settled in Tampa, which was still a young city. Tampa was really a one-horse town, literally. It was very undeveloped, and even when the cigar factories first came in, it was still you know, swampy, mosquito-infested. Within the Italian section of the city, and through his underworld dealing, Santo met and dated a local girl, Maria Giuseppe Cacciatore. <laughs> Holy crap. She was the sister she have a of more Italian name? a known drug kingpin. Dating progressed to courtship, and in April 1909, Santo and Maria were married. Unlike New York, Florida was an open state for organized crime. Regardless of family or background, up and coming mobsters could set up shop anywhere. Come on in. Be a this meant that illegal rackets were under control by several factions, such as Southern mobster Charlie Wall and Mafia drug kingpin Ignazio Antonori. Yo, these names, though. It was very violent back in the day. In fact, there was a, an article that came out that actually... Oh, this is the godson. So this is the... I, he looked like a police officer. That's what I thought. I had to read the bottom. I was like, oh, he's not... Maybe he is, but he's not. Actually labeled Tampa sort of you the hellhole of the Gulf Coast. I mean, you got that cop cut. Bald. Santo was intrigued by the underworld and started <laughs> he looks running intrigued. his own small-scale version of the illegal Spanish lottery. At least he's smiling in his picture, though. He's sort of. He's giving him a smite like a smirk. <laughs> called in with a smirk you had a hundred balls they were numbered one to a hundred people would bet on what ball would be chosen they would get them in a sack and shake them up a little bit and choose a ball and that would be the winning number Ignazio Antonori the most powerful Italian mobster in Tampa took notice of young Traficante's growing Bolita rackets Santo joined Antonori's gang and expanded his Bolita games to cover the entire Gulf Coast. Wow. Young Traficante raked in the cash. Damn, they did the whole thing, like up and down the coast? Yeah, do you think it was, you think like back then, before you had like major drugs, like I guess you still had some murders, but it seems like the crimes were like gambling and alcohol. Right. Th does it Rated seem like shit. less serious to you? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Just cause Who are you hurting with the numbers? Exactly. I guess if you don't pay, you get hurt. But again, right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Who are you hurting with the numbers, oh, everybody? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you, if you pay, you know, right, you, right. you go with the merits of like, I'll give you $2. And if I win, I get, I don't even know how it works. I right. get $6 or whatever, you know, that's cool with me. I mean, I don't think there's a problem with that. Why do you think, is, is, it, is it another conservative thing, right? That they got rid of they, you know, gambling. I mean, they they want to regulate shit that makes money, all across the board. If you're making money, no matter what you're doing, if you're making fucking cakes on a little piece of that. Somehow, you you go making cakes. You making cakes? You gotta get a license to make cakes, right? License? Why? Well, I'm just making. I'm just putting shit together in a pot, and I'm putting it in the oven, and I'm giving it to people. Well, I have to have a license. Well, we just gotta make sure you make cakes right. So the government's really Shut the gangsters. The fuck up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Give me give me seven dollars a month or whatever. The government was like, hold on, all these motherfuckers making this money off Bolita. Right. Let's start the yeah, lottery. No, 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 We're going to start hey, the Florida we lottery. lottery. Hey, we and we ain't call it Bolita. No, no. <laughs> Cause that's just too not American. It's the Florida lottery. <laughs> Put a flamingo on it. Yeah. Santo took his job seriously and soon established a ruthless reputation. My 
aunt, Aunt Rose. She was a, um, a victim of domestic violence, and her husband beat her up something fierce. Santo Traficani broke his arms. This guy never touched my, my aunt again. Meanwhile, Santo and his wife, Maria, started a family. In 1914, Luigi Santo Traficante was born. The second of five sons. Luigi! Named Santo Jr. Wow. Santo Jr. was often seen at his father's side at restaurants, like the Columbia and La Tropicana. It's clear he saw something at an early age. There was a quickness about Santo Jr. There was a determination that was lacking in the other sons. And so when Santo Jr. began to express an interest in the father's business endeavors, the father was very quick to invite him into the fold. While Santo Sr. was raising his children and running the Bolita rackets down in Tampa, his counterparts up in New York overthrew the old guard and ushered in a new way of operating. Monsters like Lucky Luciano and Tommy Lucchese thought blood between gangs was bad for business. As opposed to the old mustache Pete's, Lucchese and Luciano would partner up with anyone that could bring in more money. Guys like Santo Traficante Sr. May 1929. The up-and-coming mobster received an invite to represent the Tampa mob at a high-powered meeting in Atlantic City at the President Hotel. Santo Traficante Sr. took a train up to New York to support Lucky Luciano and some of the um, other powerhouses in the New York mob in terms of how they were going to structure the mob in the Northeast and to better part of the entire country at the time. Wow. So the so crazy how it's like national. You know what I mean? Organized. The Bloods ain't doing that. No. Yeah, and it's, and we're, we're going to wear shooting ties. We're not going to wear like uh, bandanas and we're going to assimilate. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That'll work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wear these suit and ties, and I'm going to slit your throat in the back. One point yeah. of contact for the entire state of Florida, and more importantly, Cuba. Cuba. Monsters invested heavily in Cuban narcotics, but couldn't communicate in Spanish. Santo Traficante Sr. fit the bill. He was born in Italy, but spent much of his childhood in Florida. Even though Italian was his first language, he quickly learned English. And unlike the New York gangsters, he was fluent in Spanish. Most of the guys makes you an Europe asset. Being bilingual, bro. That Not to yeah. mention, made him a crime boss because he was bilingual. And Cuba was like uncharted territory. It's kind of like the first Las Vegas. <clears throat> hmm. Right, and they would go there. Remember in the Godfather, Godfather movie? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was like a casino. It was a sex shows. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a the wild. donkey show. It was a crazy place. That's when um, Al Pacino, the Godfather, found out that uh, Fredo was the one that fucked him over. I hate in the that. during the donkey show. I hated that part of the movie because every person that I know was like a a, a Godfather fan. They'd always be like, "Fredo, I knew it was you." I'm like. That motherfucker is not me. <laughs> Freddy with an F. Exactly. Not Freddy with a P. <laughs> no, and none of them could speak Spanish, so Traficante had this little bit of an edge there. Traficante was practically a native, and to New York bosses, Santo was the perfect go between. Santo was gaining influence, but he still had to deal with his main opposition in Tampa mobster charlie wall charlie wall was just a real bad character but because his family was tied into that picture seems like they took it while he like he like he got walked in on or something like he was doing something a lot of the power it doesn't seem like a regular pose picture for like the time oh hey you want to hey. take another one no i only had one left shit don't ever walk in on me well nobody will ever again. all right he, he was just finished he's just nut lead in Tampa at the time as he rose through the criminal ranks he still maintained a lot of those contacts with the judges the politicians the police 
The wall watched Santo carefully, but didn't That's consider nice hat, him a threat. Though. The gangster was more concerned with Trepicante's boss, Ignazio Antonori. He this guy like, looks Asian a little bit. A little bit. He looks like a Japanese warlord from the 1800s. 15-year-old Santo Jr. dropped out of high school. His father told him that he's not going to learn anything more than high school. He can learn more hanging out with his father and going to New York, attending the meetings, being part of the Bolita rackets, and, and obviously getting to know these figures in this underworld. And basically grooming you to take over the mm -hmm. business mm -hmm. man fuck school get over here and learn how to be a gangster this ha this guy has such an intensity about this that i love the way Who, he, pat yeah pat's like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then he came across the and then yeah and from there it was just a it was a straight, straight shot up he was very smart he was determined he was ambitious yeah, man. and he loves this he guy did not Take no for an answer easily. As part of his training, his father sent him on long trips to New York. The elder Trafficante was close to several leaders in the New York Mafia and wanted his son to learn firsthand how they operated. Trafficante Sr. had another reason for sending his son to New York. Tampa was it? New York's always have heavy traffic, bro. They just bro, always have had heavy since traffic. Since life started down there, it's like <laughs> I cannot walk through there without having to fear for my War. life. Two rival gangs, headed by Charlie Wall and Ignazio Antonori, fought for control of Florida's gambling rackets. Santos Senior stayed clear of the conflict, hoping to gain power simply by surviving the bloody feud. You know, it's funny. I noticed a mistake in this documentary. When the smoke cleared. As a, Yo, the, shout out to photography, editor, bro. Without editor, photography, we would never be able to remember none of these people. B oh, photography. The MB rule. You know what I mean? But I noticed a mistake in this. They just couldn't get up better pictures? No, they used the wrong picture for the wrong person. <laughs> they showed Charlie Wall earlier. Not the last shot they did, but the shot before that. But it was uh, Traficante Jr., Sorry. That's the editor. Antonori was dead. Charlie Wall. No, man, we come here while I'm buzzing the nut. And Santo Traficante was stronger than ever. But ultimately, uh, Charlie Wall got pushed out. I mean, he could not compete with the Traficantes. Santo Sr. was poised to take control of Wall's territory. Charlie Wall. Was gunning for him. The new boss of Tampa was in trouble. In the 1930s, a bitter street war erupted between rival Tampa gangs. In a period later called the Era of Blood, monsters Ignazio Antonori and Charlie Wall traded hits for 10 long years. Until a lot, it's a long time to be fighting on. somebody. <laughs> what? Ten years is a long time to fight somebody. That's what I'm saying. That's like longer than World War II. Ten years is a long. I wonder how many bodies they had in ten years. Running in Tampa. In Tampa, it's not a big place. It's not. <laughs> it's like <laughs> compared to like New York or something. Compared to New York, to it's other. like Manhattan, and that's it. And everybody knows you're doing it by then. And y'all just shooting each other for ten years. Nobody's going to jail. God damn. Yeah. Nobody goes to jail. Nobody goes to jail. Nobody goes to jail. Shotty from the trade lines goes to fucking Jesus Central Christ. Park. Jesus Christ. That's how corrupt that shit was. I could throw a rock from one end of the fucking Ebor City Main Street to another. Like, if I really, really, really had a good arm. Like, maybe a good arm plus a little Superman, but, like, not much a Superman. It's not much, yeah. It's like, whoosh. It's believable if you heard that in your folklore. Right. At one time, Thompson yeah. threw a rock yeah. across town. Yeah. I could believe yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> Tenori with a sawed-off shotgun. The war virtually wiped out both sides leaving a power vacuum behind. With his main competition decimated, up-and-coming mobster yeah, Santo Traficante Sr. took cool. over all major gambling rackets. Santo Sr. became the boss of Tampa. The house. He really solidified his hold. 
For the next decade, Traficante reigned quietly over his Florida territory. And another 10 years. Reigned quietly. Did 10 years of fucking bloody war oh. and then 10 years of reigning quietly over everything and then you die of stomach cancer. New threat was looming. The federal government the was bearing down on the mafia. In 1950, Tennessee Senator Estes Kefauver took aim at organized crime in America. The tremendous importance of organized crime, uh, it's even greater than we thought it was. As part of his Senate inquiry, Kefauver crossed the country, investigating the mob through televised hearings. Senator Estes Kefauver was an ambitious young liberal senator from Tennessee and like many politicians he decided that he was going to make a name for himself by looking into organized crime. In December, Kefauver's tour stopped in Tampa and issued a flurry of subpoenas to members <laughs> of the criminal underworld. He made a rain subpoenas instead of flurry. The main goal of the Kefauver hearings was basically to target corruption this guy's definitely a cop. Tampa's actually like, one of the he became a cop, first right? That maybe, guy's a cop, right? Maybe, they, maybe it was like some departed shit. I don't know. That guy looks like a cop, like a motherfucker. And he's to, talking like a cop. They sent him to fuck a police school. He's so got the have, cadence of a police officer. I mean, if you were raining on a town for 20, 30 years, you could send some people to fuck a cop school. He said some departed shit, right? Yeah. <laughs> time that America got to see these mobsters on TV. The committee then turned its attention to the Traficantes. They estimated the family took in more than $15 million a year in illegal gambling alone. The Tennessee senator nice. subpoenaed both Santos Sr. and Jr. to testify before the committee. Can you really blame uh, Sancho Traficante Jr.? Like, he was bred into it, man. Like, it wasn't like we were talking earlier, like Bobby Kennedy becoming like a crusader. At for a certain point, yes, you can blame anybody for anything. Like, at a certain point, you're just. Bro, his dad told him at 15 no, I know. years old. I know. I get it. I it's get crazy. It. When That's you say, crazy. can you blame him? Yeah, at a certain point, it's just like, no, I'm not going to do this. Yeah, maybe not at 15. But 18, 19, 20, 21 is around the age, and you're just like, you're to me, when you're just responsible. That's I would say hard, 15, man. no. I know it's hard. It's hard. Because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, I, I say it all the time, man. It's just like that gray area of gradients of like change, and that's the hard portion of life when it's like, should I or shouldn't I? I'm on the cusp. It's the cusp, you know, and it's difficult. But, me as a person sitting over here, that's when I start to actually blame you, not your parents. Yeah. Sorry. At some point, it ha it has to happen at some point, bro. It may be hard, but it's like it, it's not like it can never happen. Walk away from I'm the money. I'm not giving you to 30, bro. I'm not giving you 30. You're going to walk away from the money, the power, the influence, and not having your father's respect. Illegal. It's a lot. Not even just illegal, but like bad. You know, yeah, sad out shit. murders, You're killing people, and all of that shit. Yeah. So, it's okay. Yeah. Your dad did it for a living. It's not okay. Your dad did it for a living. At it's a certain you know. point, it's all you know. At a certain point, you're wrong. I mean, how how could he decipher that if the priest loves his father, right? Politicians love his father. The police love his father. You know, all the social constructs of people that you would look up to and respect love your father. Why would you not admire to be somebody like that? It wasn't until Folger Crawford, whatever the fuck his last <laughs> name, right? Until he came in and started raining subpoenas on people. No, yeah. That he first was like, oh, wait a minute, I'm doing something wrong. No, I, I, I recognize that if you're, if you're insulated and you're like blocked off from the outside world. Affluenza. I'm too, I don't know what was going on. I don't know what was going on. I thought it was fine to. Just rape this girl. My daddy told me to kill people. <laughs> <laughs> so, Maybe he has um, Asperger's. <laughs> but 
you know if if we're to uh continue to evolve and move forward as a culture of being beings then no he's wrong and he's got to go back to froger's love that's it i'm sorry that your daddy taught you wrong but you did some fucked up shit so keep it moving bro all right, Froger Love Crystal. I don't fuck around, bro. Keith Alver then ratchets Keith up Fulver. the pressure even further by calling Froger's Love Crystal. his oldest rivals, 71-year-old Charlie Wall. Keith Alver wasn't after the has-been mobster. He wanted Called him a has-been. Respect my name, please. Charlie Wall did testify at that committee. You're an old gangster. I was, in, I was sperm when you were committing crime. I need the new, I need the new blood. Mm structure of organized crime in Tampa. For the first time, the federal government understood the nature of the Traficante family business. That was enough for Santos Sr. and son. The Traficantes packed their bags. They skipped town. Cuba was a place where they can go to when the heat got too much and in the United States and it was a place where they were making money legally where they had you know a lot of things at their fingertips the Traficantes settled in and found just about anything at their disposal well, I mean it was Santos Fantasy Island I mean he had free reign of not only the casinos but anything he, he wanted he could get I mean anything he wanted you had people like Sinatra, we'll Marilyn see. Monroe, and top celebrities going down there. And I think a really good parallel would be Las Vegas today, where you have all these celebrities going there. And Havana became that place. For years, this is before Castro. The had funneled millions from American mobsters to Cuban dictator Fulgencia Batista. The Cuban leader, in turn, kept the local authorities away from their narcotics rackets. Wow. The relationship between the mob and Batista Here's was my guy. thoroughly, absolutely hey, Pat. corrupt. Um, Batista made a fortune off of the mob's presence in Havana. He got a skim from everything. Santos Sr. enjoyed his time in Cuba. But the 64-year-old's health had become an issue he was diagnosed with stomach cancer. Like good life, bro. Santos Sr. knew his time was running out. He's out there drinking hard every night. So he started handing over the reins of his operation. Looking all to kinds his son. of strange. Eating all kinds of filet mignons. It was he just got stomach cancer. With his father that he was going to 20 years of just that opulence. Back in Tampa, the key father committee Can't had left town. I hate to break sometimes. The Traficantes could safely return to Speaking Florida. Which, indulgence, man. Soon encounter a full-scale mob war. It. The stakes were high. The Traficantes could either wipe out the competition or lose everything they had. Tampa prepared for war. In 1950, Tampa mobster Santo Travacante Sr. and his son had an opportunity to consolidate their rule over crime in the state. One of their competitors, mobster Red Italiano, had his own gambling rackets, but left town during the Kefauver hearings and never came back. While Red was gone, his gang would answer to his inexperienced right-hand man, Jimmy Lumia. The Traficantes thought they could take advantage of Lumia's weak leadership. Like all, these, all these people that we're seeing gangster. are look very unassuming people. Like the guy with the golf hat, you know the guy with the fedora, you know the guy was just old and smiling, and uh, this guy looks like some sort of computer nerd. Yeah, they look like they work at like the city water. Yeah, electric. These guys are like mob bosses in Tampa. They assimilated. Yeah, they did. <laughs> Except the first, the other guy. That's what I'm saying. That like, it was it because they were just Italian, or was it because they were better accepted because they looked re like regular people in society? So it was easy for them. You know, yeah. they're not walking around with sag pants and a blood bandana. Mm -hmm. You know, and, th and this kind of like targets, unfortunately. Yeah, because they don't look different. They look. Pro they look. 
professional white people. Yeah, they were better able to organize. They had yeah, it was more connections. Them. Like uh, it's harder when your skin is darker. Yeah, you could pay off a politician. He looks just like you. Yeah, Charlie Wall looks like he ran for Senate. <laughs> he does, bro. Yo, so does this guy. Whoever, who's the last guy we were just talking about? Uh, Lucky, uh, I don't know. No, Lef- the guy right, the, the glasses. That Cinder, Cinder Folly? Anyway, him. These Molita rackets. The Traficantes never had a lot of members, so they never really had the strength to exert their influence completely over South Florida. Although, a lot of gangsters that did business in South Florida would either pay tribute or ask permission or go into business with the Traficantes. So they still had their fingers in the pie, but they didn't per se control Miami and South Florida. Fingers in the pie. It was Shout time for Santo Jr. Bar. to act and take out his rivals once and for all. In the days leading up to the war with Lumia, Santo Jr. assumed day-to-day management of the family business. Santo Jr. The young man carried himself with an air of calm dignity. He hardly looked like a gangster. He just said that. Right? He was not the typical mafia chieftain. I mean, this was someone who was well read. He was very well groomed, horn rimmed glasses, you know, tailor made suits. I mean, this is, these are not the, the thugs that you'd see on the streets in, in, in the north of the United States. So there's a totally different kind of breed. Santo Jr. was described by most people that knew him as his kind, quiet gentleman. He was really respected by other mafia figures as well as people in the legitimate business world. He kept it really low key. But there was a side of Santo Jr. that people rarely saw. Unlike his father, who was content to rule quietly behind the scenes, Santo Jr. was more direct, brutal at times. The upcoming war with Jimmy Lumia would bring out the Jimmy Lumia. Of Santo that's what it was. Jr. If Santo could get Lumia out of the picture, then he could control all of Tampa himself. On June 5th, 1950, hitmen went after Jimmy Lumia. Uh Uh-oh. He stopped his car to talk to some employees and another car came up beside him and blew his head off. Damn. Damn, Jimmy. The police suspected Santo Jr. was behind the hit, but never had the evidence to charge him. With Lumia gone, Santo Jr. continued his rampage, hunting down Italiano's crew, leaving a trail of bodies behind. Hey, Mambo, Mambo Italiano. One by one, and the police Shout out to my couldn't hang a charge on anyone. Signella part of a crew. 1952. Even with Lumia dead and Italiano out of town, hey, Mambo, Mambo Italiano, war with Traficante. But the mob killings were taking their toll on the public. There's a lot more of a public outcry for the police to do something, so you see more of a concentrated effort to That's solve something. That's when it gets to be murders, too much, right? When people decide ever. to make us think about it, you know, when somebody or decides to write a letter, just trying to get. Get it's always when office. somebody who's in power gets affected. That's when stuff starts to happen. Pills, the crack epidemic. So, like, oh, now it's a problem because my daughter is affected. God damn it. Do something about it. Conclusively solved. Man. Still, the violence continued. January 3rd, 1953. At 7.25, one of Santo's drivers picked him up after dinner at a relative's house. The mobster sedan pulled away, but another car was racing toward him. Without warning, a 12-gauge shotgun unloaded into Santo's car. Buckshot nicked Traficante's arm. He pushed open the car door. They should have done it with a Tommy gun. The shotgun is from Florida shit. Yeah, like, Should have rolled up with a Tommy gun and sprayed him. Door, it it up, hit somebody right? buckshot? It's not going to really kill anybody. It's going to hurt a lot. The street. Is that a Tommy gun? The unknown gunman tore off, leaving Traficante for dead. Traficante was grazed in the arm, went <laughs> to the hospital, and refused to tell investigators anything. 
No one took credit for the hit, but rumors circulated not, that it was an missed. act of revenge by the family's hated rival. Well, you can Charlie took this Wall. picture, I'm gonna shoot you. Wall. He looks like he would use a shotgun. The yeah, former dean of the underworld was later found brutally murdered in Damn, his Damn, bro. Charlie Wall's death remains unsolved. There was never any kind of conviction. It remains unsolved to this day. <laughs> oh, wow. While Tropicante like warred on the streets thing. of Tampa, his father... Huh? I think it's pretty crazy. They, they don't know what happened to this day. Because of that power, in bro. 2019. They, you think they're still uh, to this, today? Like... Well, they're both dead, but what if the last one died? Uh, Junior died in '86. Does it? The family, the money, and all that's just gone somewhere. Nah, uh, there's like, uh, I think uh, his daughter's on like a travel agency. Yeah, <laughs> and I guess his, his godson is a cop. Fully, <laughs> Maybe fully, fully out of the business, right? Sixty-eight-year-old Santos Senior had finally succumbed. To that's like that's it. like the face of getting away with it all. Yeah, it is. <laughs> for twenty years, two decades. His death certificate said he was a simple cigar maker. Wow. His death wasn't really noted very much. It was a small little article in the paper, and it was a more of a low-key kind of funeral, which fit him because he was a very low-key mob boss. In fact, there's very little, if any, public record of him surviving to this day. I mean, we've only seen one picture of the motherfucker since now, we've uh, started Santo this shit. Jr. It's the same one they had on his coffin and shit. Everything's one picture. That's that's how you know real G's move in silence. Like Talk uh, about lasagna, the pity, of, the pity of, <laughs> of a little Wade verse. Mother's <laughs> place. You can see him really handing over a lot of the operations to Santo Junior at the time. I and just got that bar. Mm -hmm. It's some Italian shit. Well, yeah, yeah. Real G's moves like he said something like lasagna. Real G's moving silent. I was like, why would he say lasagna? But it's a because it's to the G being yeah. silent in lasagna. Welcome to the club from that 2006 song or whatever. I thought it was. I thought it was a simile towards the Italian Bob because it's lasagna Italian. No, no, it's that. Metaphor, so in that way, it's a triple entendre. Oh. In that way, it's a triple entendre because it's that and that plus the actual lasagna. You don't say the G, right? Damn, little Wayne, you were so little, Hey, that's why he's one of the goats, man. He is. That's why he's one of the goats, because that little I, shit like that. In 1954, the mantle was officially passed to Santo Jr. Jr. then becomes the mafia chieftain of Florida and the southern part of the United States. I mean, it was just a natural progression. Santo was not a man given to a lot of grieving. It was business. This was business, and he had to move on and make his mark, and he did. The other mob bosses in New York City and beyond knew he was the heir apparent. Traficante was viewed very well by most of the other mafia families around the country, and he definitely. I mean, if you got right the, the if you position. got the product, man, well, I the think fuck? what's happening? It's all your dad died, but let's do it. You've been a gangster since before your dad started being a gangster. Yeah, so I mean, bread it's, it's a no-brainer, it. right? This guy's a full-bred pimp. As long as he just steps into it with some confidence, you're good to go. The lineage. Not seem to be a lot of dissension in the ranks of the local family as well. Santo Traficante Jr. had assumed his father's role. He was the boss of Tampa's criminal underworld. Santo seemed untouchable. That is, until his name was connected to a high profile mob murder. In 1954, Santo Traficante Sr. had died after a long bout with stomach cancer. His son, Santo Jr., took over as boss at the age of 39. And with the name Traficante, Santo did not have to advertise. In the 1950s, Santo Jr. was a critical link to gambling and drug rackets in Havana, Cuba. Traficante was the perfect mob emissary, bribing Cuban dictator Fulgencio Batista to keep police clear of mafia-run casinos in Havana. Damn, it's just that easy, man. Then, on October 24th, 1957, the high-profile New York mobster Albert Anastasia met with Santo Jr. in New York. 
the mob's lured high executioner, wanted part of Traficante's action in Cuba. Traficante was a little leery of letting Anastasia move in. Um, kind of viewed Anastasia as being a little rough around the edges and didn't really want any more competition down there. He was trying to muscle his way into Havana, and Santo had a great thing going in Havana. They didn't want to mess that up. The Three years day, after his father Anastasia died. Anastasia got his hair cut at the barber shop in the Park Sheraton Hotel in Midtown Manhattan. The real interesting thing is that Traficante was staying at the Park Sheridan Hotel in New York under the alias of B. Hill. And the morning he checked out, but a couple hours later, Anastasia went to that same hotel to get his weekly shave. And while he was in the barber seat with the hot towel wrapped around his face, some gunmen came in and killed him. Coincidence? Why would he go to the same one out of some theories the best or something? Well, maybe he knew that that was where he was going to be no, at. He definitely seems like he did. He had an issue with him asking too many questions about his connect instead of Johnny Brass, the Johnny Depp in Blow, where he just was like, "All right, come on." He was like, "No, nah, I don't even like you asking questions." <laughs> right. gonna shoot you first. There was widespread speculation that New York mobsters were behind the hit, but Santo Jr remained a suspect and they tried to pin that on Santa, not me never, ever pinned that on him I and mean, there was no really tangible evidence that actually could link it to him in fact santo was on a plane two hours before his murder going to havana wow two years later in 1959 when santo traficante jr traveled to cuba he found a much different country than he remembered. Cuba was in the midst of a revolution. Fidel Castro Fidel was poised to seize control from Batista. In the period before the... And we know Fidel likes to talk about eggs and strategize. No. Like five o'clock in the morning. Hey, man. Was he much better? Than this guy who gets paid by uh, mob bosses. I mean, he definitely got rid of the mob, but I don't know if it was better because then there was really no economy left in Cuba. Some say it was more prof- prosperous under Batista. So what was what did ha- what happened to Cuba afterwards? Was it all bad shit? Well, you know? I don't know. From our point of view, and the way we live in a capitalistic society, and all the infinite amount of stuff that we get to choose from yeah, and man. live in a prototypical free society it would look like no but if you're elian gonzalez and loves it. you it's love it dope. it's about the people it's like so what that we don't have a lot of steak and we have to eat octopus seven times a week you know what i mean it's so it just depends perception right yeah we're finding out that 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 what you said at the beginning of the episode yeah. lies true across the border yeah. across everything you know what i mean yeah revolution uh, the country was corrupt batista was a dictator and he was being paid off uh, by the mob and the mob had all of the casinos in havana and all of the allied services which would include prostitution traficante and his associates worried that castro might not be as easy to corrupt the mob made $100 million a year from Cuban casinos alone. Well, back then. It was up to Santo Jr. to keep the Cuban rackets intact, regardless wow. of the revolution's outcome. He placed bets on both sides. What he did, not only was he a Batista supporter, but he also su- supported Fidel Castro. He never thought that anything would ever end. Traficante supplied Castro with guns and money, with the understanding that the mob's Cuban casinos could remain. By the spring of 1959, Castro had taken over the country completely and forced Batista out. With Batista gone, mobsters tested Castro. All those cars that just drove away are still in Cuba. Still like, pr- like They're right still there. there. Yeah, I've same cars. Of them same like cars. Yesterday. Hopefully Great mechanics over there, lives. apparently. As Batista, not part changers. <laughs> <laughs> for years, 
they would be disappointed. Castro became a okay. communist dictator. If you can talk in this world, if you can like mobsters that had supported him in his rise to power, you can feel like I don't mean to make him sound like Hitler. I was gonna say, you know what I mean? Just the way you like talk to people and make Martin them, Luther King, everybody like, that's popular in that way, Malcolm X, fucking um, Forrest Gump, Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton, Obama. Barack Obama. Yeah, it's just that if you fucking like flame them with the vocabulary and you hit them you make them laugh and you hit them with little things it doesn't really even matter the rock like people love you people fucking love you and they will follow you even if you're wrong as shit and you're about to get them killed yeah <laughs> that, that's that stage charisma it's crazy you gotta not you gotta also be able to kill people mercilessly but you gotta have that stage game stage talk it's, yeah, yeah. It's that's all the, of it that's the, that's the next elevation of pimp talk <laughs> Fidel Castro came to power in January 1959. He was clearly moving um, Cuba in a leftward direction, uh, causing considerable concern in the United States. Causing considerable also, concern. Uh, taking various steps against the mob-controlled casinos in Havana, which was making the mob very unhappy. I think pretty soon the Yo, mob he lived till they he fucking get died. What they bargained for, but he did <laughs> that. No, no. Till he died, he didn't get killed. <laughs> no, I know. He didn't have an accident. It was till he decided to like, yeah, like I'm done with life, and then we're not even going to tell the rest of the world for. And a few he came years with the after. mob, bro. He came with the mob and the government. Balls. I don't know. A little don't, island that looks know. like a peepee. I don't know. That peepee. I don't know, man. I don't know, man. Jeeps. He closed all the casinos and kicked a lot of the gangsters out. On June 9, nineteen fifty nine. Two weeks before the wedding of Santo Jr.'s daughter in Havana, Cuban authorities arrested the mobster. Oh, I didn't know about this. came and knocked on the door one night and um, ransacked his, uh, his uh, apartment and um, hauled him off to jail. The police slapped him with vague charges and detained him. The news sent shockwaves through the underworld. Santo was actually detained, and they were not letting him go. I mean, he was, uh, he was actually on the list for the firing squad. Castro's new regime ordered hundreds of executions. Oh, shit. Trapacante's days appeared to be numbered. Somebody just got murked in that clip. Whatever clip that was, he did not live. He fell into a ditch. In 1959... Fidel Castro led a revolution against Cuban dictator Fulgencio Batista. You got to be so excited for Fidel that like 700 you are going to jump on that truck and ride down the city. Wow. <laughs> like no I'm room a, in that people truck. People in the center. God bless them. Once in power, Castro turned on the same American mobsters that had backed his revolt. Oh, so there were American mobsters that backed Fidel Castro's revolt? Remember he was saying uh, Traficante gave a lot of guns Oh, he uh, backed both sides. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just to see hey, whoever's going to win. Yeah. Without warning, he, he turned on him. Santo Traficante Jr. and threw him in prison. Damn, he flipped on him. Really there were no That's charges. Dirty. There were no I, the, God, charges. the Godfather has a lot of reality to it in the movie. Yeah. Is there anything like that? Santo's wife, Josephine, wanted her husband to attend their daughter's wedding in Havana, but he was locked up. In an act of desperation, she reached out to Cuban authorities. Josephine was from a very well-connected family, politically and commercially in Florida. Josephine somehow got in touch with the Ministry of Justice and persuaded them to let him have a furlough to actually go and attend his daughter's wedding. And in fact, they actually let him attend his daughter's wedding, but as soon as the wedding ended, he was rushed right back to the detention center. For the time being, Traficante was. Yo, she had some power, though. Absolutely. Get him out of jail. Like, that's just not for a little bit. Just anybody. Just for a little bit. Trapped. I wonder if that's the scene that all those movies are based off of. Because those movies are always like, you know, you know, the movies where the, 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 co- the dad's out for a little while just to get his daughters. I wonder if that's the one actual story that all that shit's based off of. I also, this reminds me of like 
when we were talking about the cocaine cowboys and we started talking about Pablo Escobar being so rich, I don't think they add Santo Traficante to a lot of these lists because he's such a like low key Don. Yeah, no, silent look at Don him. and like the dude had a lot of power. Yeah. At mul- a multi billionaire. Tampa. Tampa. Multi billionaire. Fucking Tampa. And had everybody across the United States, Traficante senators. Attorney contacted Catholic you know what I mean? Government. Fuck, man. Judges, lawyers. Hoping to spring Santo Jr. Cops. Cuba eventually released and deported the mobster. He returned home to Tampa dejected, leaving his casinos behind. Trav Conte lost the Cuban casinos. I mean, he took a lot of money out of Cuba before he left, but he also lost a lot of investment. With the loss of Havana, mobsters needed a new spot to rebuild their gambling empires. They picked Las Vegas, Nevada. Santo Jr. had enjoyed running the Cuban casinos, but was hesitant to invest in an operation within the United States. I think really by the time Traficante finally realized, hey, maybe I should get into Vegas, it might have been too late. Right. This point. At the time, he felt it would be wiser to build another casino empire somewhere in the Caribbean. Over the next few years, especially through the mid 60s, you see him sending emissaries to Ecuador, to the Bahamas, to the Virgin Islands, to Venezuela, all throughout Central, South America, and the Caribbean to open up casino operations there. None of them ever really panned out the way he wanted it to. While Traficante Maybe he didn't have the power of his dad. His dad was able to pull that off. I wonder why. So in Cuba, what about the Cuban senior Traficante connection? Made remember it so remember how we well, we first started hearing about the fact that he was multilingual. I mean, this guy really came from Sicily. Right. He really ate the shit of the bottom. So I think when you're breeded at that level and you have to come into your own by yourself, yeah. it gives you a certain level of like navigation. Maybe yeah. because his son had so much uh what is it called Privilege. uh but what is it called when you give somebody you know or family members like a job isn't it called um, um it's called it starts with an n right it's called nepotism nepotism i was gonna say neapolitan but that's an ice cream Got so nepotism maybe that's what he was suffering from because he had his dad kind of connect everything i mean even his first meeting with powerful people in new york and it was in chicago when he was like young and they it's sent all him out. through yeah. his father yeah, yeah, yeah. so he doesn't and then his father dies and yeah you could be ruthless it's real easy to put people to go kill somebody yeah, yeah. when they respect you but if you ain't have the ability to build it by yourself mm-hmm. like your father the charisma that maybe he was a grand speaker and yeah. just a guy that was uh, a mover and shaker. He knew how to control the environment, yeah. and it, it, he had all the power, but he couldn't hold on to it. Yeah, man, well, that's crazy, man. Absolutely. Hey, to resurrect his casino business, America was entrenched in the Cold War. The CIA considered Castro a threat. Having a communist country ninety miles off the coast of Florida presented a clear and present danger to the United States. Hey, that's a movie. Yeah, Jack Ryan. CIA operative Robert Mayhew set up a meeting with Traficante. He told the... That guy had the CIA face. Tampa mobster. I hate to make cold cuts face. (laughs) Wanted him to use his Cuban contacts (laughs) to assassinate Castro. He was recruited by Bob Mayhew to actually deal with Cubans because he knew the Cubans. Now, Bob Mayhew better be able to make a killer sandwich with a name like Mayhew. Right. Connie was inevitably the key figure because he was the one who had lived and worked in Havana and knew all these Cuban political figures who might be able to help. Santo could get in and have someone placed close to Fidel Castro if they actually wanted to commit a hit on him. Traficante told the CIA that he would go along with the plot. Wow. But in reality, the gangster never intended to carry out the hit. You think the CIA is recruiting bloods to do hits? 
They recruited everybody else. Didn't they recruit a game show host at some point in the That's 70s? crazy. They keep it moving, man. That whatever right? CIA is the real gangsters. Hey, man. I hope that doesn't that. get translated by some algorithm and then you come see us. I love the CIA. I mean, I don't think anybody loves the CIA. I love the CIA. I don't think you love the CIA. I do. I don't think you do. The funny thing about this is that Santo saw an opportunity to make money, and he basically told the CIA and all the agents whatever they wanted to hear. In fact, they gave him these secret pills. If you would put in, in Fidel Castro's drink, that somehow it would react and you know, it would kill him on the spot or whatever the case might be. Santo flushed those down the toilet. The agency believed that the persons to do the assassination would be the mob, which absolutely demonstrated that they hadn't the slightest idea what the mob was. Well, we got to wow. stop flushing shit down the toilet because it's really fucking with the turtles. Yeah, we don't kill the turtles at all. But I like what he said. The agency thought that it would be someone from the mob to do the killing. It's because they absolutely didn't know what the mob was about. <laughs> I love how you just said that. They're not hired assassins. You can't go down to Carlos Marcelo and I'd like to kill my wife. Here's $10,000 and he takes care of it. The killings that take place in the mob are business killings. And nobody's paid. You're expected to do it as part of your, your job. <laughs> Still, Traffic County played along with the CIA. You don't know the rules of the Costa Nostra. <laughs> Thanks for the check, though. CIA's plan. It was a quick way to make some easy cash. That does not look like real money. I just want to say that was the worst uh, B-roll that you guys could have picked. <laughs> He was just taking money from the agency and and laughing all the way to the bank. Traffic yeah, County yeah, had yeah, no yeah, for qualms sure, for about sure, it. For sure, for sure. Give me that. Well, yeah. How much? Absolutely. I'll do that. You want me to kill who? Yeah, let me have those pills. I'll flush them down. It's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Swindling. Castro as a double agent. There have been many rumors about him working both sides of the street. And you got to believe that there's some information exchanging hands. Absolutely, right? Some he knows something. He knew something. Nothing else. What he's not saying. In the months ahead, Keep my mouth speculation of a more serious nature would surround Traficanti as a devastating tragedy wow. shocked the nation. So he was involved in the JFK what they're saying. assassination. That's what they're alluding to. As the sun shone in Dallas, Texas. Dallas, Texas. A lone gunman named Lee Harvey Oswald. Open. Definitely looks like he had Asperger's. Fire and killed 46 year old President John F. Kennedy. Almost as soon as the last reports faded from Oswald's rifle. Conspiracy theories surrounding the assassination surfaced. Wow. One persistent, though never substantiated, rumor alleges that Santo Traficante Jr. was a major player. Wow. This Fucking Tampa, Florida. Rooted in events that began Fucking Florida. Earlier. Nineteen sixty-one. In Washington, D.C., Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy made it his mission Bobby. to decimate organized crime in America. There are a number of different areas in where uh, action is needed. The uh, field of organized crime, I think, is a very serious situation. Oh, maybe that's why he wanted to go after Bobby was because he's like, well, I'm the son of a gangster. You should be the son of a gangster. And you're coming out of line and disrespecting us. We're going to show you the fuck it is like joe was part of the mob you know right. joe, the kennedy's dad mm -hmm. it's crazy man but he didn't like how he was acting nah. as far as like the code goes he's supposed to be part of the game but he, he didn't he Takashi said, he kennedy takashi kennedy kennedy six nine yo kennedy six nine for real <laughs> that's what's happening right now back then right now Robert back Kennedy's then priorities were to convict and incarcerate as many leading mobsters as he could by any possible means. He turned this into his own personal crusade. Kennedy targeted the mob's corruption of unions. 
Jimmy Hoffa, the president of the Teamsters Union. He looks constipated. Who? Neither did you. Racist fool. You. Who? Did you. Mobster, Santo Traficante Jr. You motherfucker, you sitting there. Traficante complaining about Kennedy and remarked, mark my words, this man is trouble. I would like to say Traficante is the only gangster that I've ever seen wear a bow tie. Are we counting Malcolm X as a gangster? Not really. Nah. Okay. He, he was uh, Malcolm G Little or Green before that. Right, right. When he will get what's coming to him. At the time, attorney Frank Regano represented Hoffa, Traficante, and New Orleans mob boss Carlos Marcello. Hoffa, Marcello, and Traficante all wanted the Bobby Kennedy problem to go away. But removing the attorney general wouldn't end their troubles. At this Over juncture, top. one expert suggests yeah. the focus shifted to the president. You had to kill the president. Well, Bobby got it, he got, got shot, shot too, last yeah. time. Yeah, he got, he got, shot, got shot later on. The Chopped the something. tail off. Robert Kennedy, the dog, would still be alive and would bite you. But if you chop the head off, everything's gone. According to this theory, Hoffa delivered a deadly message to Marcello and Traficanti through Regano. Hoffa called him aside and told him to tell them that the time had come to assassinate John F. Kennedy. Wow, he's just saying and that. He delivered that message, and then much to his surprise, instead of bursting out laughing, Marcello and Traficanti simply gave each other a very long, rather cold look. Maybe that's how they deciphered their shit. They had staring contest. Whoever broke the stare Jesus wins that shit. How <laughs> ah, you book your eye first? You're dead. <laughs> yes. This theory plays out. Traficanti contacted a man he had met in Havana prison. Can I blunk an eye or is it blink an eye? Blunk? Isn't because if I blink an eye, is that blink double? What are you talking about? Never mind. Blunk. Yeah. What, what what is blunk? Like one eye? That that'd just be a blink, right? Yeah, you, your eyes blink. I thought for some reason blink was plural because eyes. Should I think about? You know. What okay. I mean? <laughs> Lauren Hall. Hall in turn got in touch Yo, with blunt Lee Harvey Oswald, real quick. the man who would pull the trigger in Dallas. Something has happened in the motorcade route. Something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. Oh, no. Possibly Traficante. On the night of November 22nd, as the rest well, of the We country, remember the guy that shot Lee Hardy Hoswell in the... Was J Jack Ruby in the uh, parking right. lot. And that guy was related to some gangster shit or associated with some gangster shit. Mm. Did he, you think he owns Ruby Tuesdays? Maybe, no. probably not. I don't know. If especially because is he dead? Santo yeah, Jr. yeah, he guy's dead, right? Yeah. Didn't he Had die in jail? With, just say like, why else would you call your restaurant Ruby Tuesdays? Maybe the daughter's name is Ruby. Maybe Frank Regano and she died on a Tuesday. The two men raised their glasses and toasted the death of President Kennedy. It was a moment. This is all alleged. I know they're just saying that shit, right? I was just thinking like, wow. Straw. I think that was really when I really crossed it. When I started in thinking about it, and here I am celebrating the death of the president. You know, that I realized and became cognizant of the fact that I had crossed that line. Huh. My mom witnessed that. She actually got up and left. And they, she couldn't believe what was happening before her eyes. I mean, you have these two people. Everyone in the United States is mourning. And these two people are sitting there toasting the assassination of the president of the United States. Hmm. That same day, Chris Regano says his father had received a call from his other client, Jimmy Hoffa. We all know he the disappeared. Everyone's weeping in my father's office. Him, right? And apparently one of the secretaries tells my father, Mr. Hoffa's on the phone. My father goes into... His, his office takes the phone call and Jimmy's on the other end saying, did you hear the good news? They killed the son of a... Traficante's old cellmate, Lauren Hall, later got a phone call at home from a reporter for the National Enquirer. Hall was apparently drunk and uh, he was very abusive toward the reporter <laughs> and he was more or less refusing to say anything. And uh, then finally, suddenly, Hall declares, listen, <laughs> 
The only two people left alive who still know anything are me and Sandro Traficanti. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to stay alive. <laughs> so I'm not going to say <laughs> <laughs> in the end, the Warren Trying to stay alive, to stay alive homie. Kennedy's death. I ain't say shit. Shit. Or anyone other than Lee Harvey Oswald. The commission. That guy looked like that he has like acted alone. Some type of weird disorder. He couldn't have done Traficante it. Traficanti was don't know. never charged was with pretty, anything uh, related to the assassination. Trained. He was like trying to get better at stuff. But even to this day. Time. Rumors persist about the role Santo Traficante and the mob Traficante might and have his played in the events of November twenty second. Hey, see but here. Now, I definitely believe that Traficante was Tyson. deeply involved in the assassination. Gave All right, Takashi six nine. If there were to the rumors, that truth would go to the grave with Traficante. Decades later, in nineteen eighty one. The federal government finally found a charge that would stick huh. would to stick. Santo Traficante Jr. Look at that other picture of him, finally. The government felt that it had enough evidence against Santo to charge him. Santo Jr. needed the help of a good lawyer. His longtime attorney, Frank Regano, had spent years trying to distance his practice from clients like Traficante. But Santo Jr. could be very convincing. Yeah, it's like be my lawyer, okay. He said, "Look, if you don't represent me, I'm gonna kill you. Your son won't make it, and he's referring to me." Oh, oh that he's the lawyer's son. Holy shit! Dude. And he's the god man. Holy the attorney was shit. like, "I want you to be the godfather of my son, so that I can't I have the ability to kill him if I have to." Damn, Damn the plot homie. thick is it's super like thick. a fat lady. He is thick and super thick now. The guy who's talking to us the whole time is a lawyer's son, so maybe he is a cop. Even more so now. Wow. Regano took the case, but Santo Jr.'s health issues were overwhelming and delayed his trial. He was by now an old man. His health was failing. Right, he's going to die. Problems. He had had intestinal surgery. He had a bad heart. Him and his dad had stomach issues. Failing quickly. In March of 1987, Santo checked into a Houston hospital for a heart bypass. The 72-year-old didn't survive the surgery. The operation was a success. He just never woke up from the anesthesia. What? He, he died um, after they'd sewn him back up again. Damn, the irony. And Junior remain the most elusive. You got taken out by the gas. In mafia history. The most elusive son and father now, duo in mafia history from Tampa, murder. Florida. They managed to avoid spending a single night in an American jail. Never went to jail. It was Santo Senior. Multi billion dollar industry. Tampa. Never went to jail. Never went to jail. Tampa. Multi billion dollars. Tampa's a gangster. Running ass. numbers and drugs and all the other shit. Alcohol. For for Bootleg. so the senior was for two decades. Started in the thirties, late twenties, early thirties. Fifties, and this guy took it to the eighties. Eighties, bro. So it's a fifty it's a half a de a half a century of of getting it of a uh, crime never go to jail never going to jail never go multi-billion dollar business never went to jail tampa florida that's crazy amazingly it's terrible of course whatever but that's still awesome at the same time we got that shit depending on your perception absolutely depending on the perception it could be amazing or fucked up or a little bit of both like i keep saying it's fucking crazy man tampa you definitely, I, I bet you that, because I know the senior's still buried in Tampa, so I'm going to assume that Junior's also in Tampa. Tampa Traficante, bro. Crazy times, crazy times. Well, it's uh, Fresh Produce Florida Media. If you want to rat anybody out and send us your paperwork, you can uh, email us. Uh, please like, comment, subscribe on uh, any platform that you receive this podcast. Which would probably be YouTube. Pigeons. But yeah, sometime pigeons. in the Send future, we might end up on another platform. Or little frogs. You know? I'm the Fredo Peens. I'm still Thompson, and today I was drunker than normal. And we love the CIA. <laughs> Some of us do. Peace and love, y'all.